welcome to my talk documenting Hadza 2019 to 2021, a retrospective. Documentary linguistics is a major subfield of linguistics interested in the creation of lasting, multi-purpose records of languages. This talk provides an in-depth look at one such documentary linguistic project, a project documenting the Hadza language, funded by the Endangered Languages Documentation Program, ELDP which took place from 2019 to 2021. Following some brief context, both on the Hadza language and on the researchers, the talk presents the documentary projects in a stepwise fashion from preparation to project setup to daily activities to archiving. Uh, the talk then reviews the principal output of the project, and then uh, we reflect on feedback from the Hadza people themselves who were involved in the documentary project. First of all, I'd like to note that a recording of this talk will be made available shortly after its live presentation, both on Zenodo at the DOI given, as well as on YouTube via the QR code on screen. I'd like now to briefly introduce the language whose documentation the current talk will address, Hadza. Geographically speaking, Hadza is spoken primarily in the area around Lake Eyasi in the East African country of Tanzania. Some of the communities visited during the documentation project are highlighted with blue circles here. Genetically, Hadza was originally classified as a member of the so-called Khoisan phylum of languages, linking it with other languages which employ phonemic click consonants spoken far away to the southwest of the African continent. Today, it's widely recognized that Khoisan is not a coherent generic grouping and that Hadza cannot be convincingly linked to any so-called Khoisan language or, for that matter, any other language. It's therefore best described as a language isolate. From this map, itself from a classic work on the Tanzanian Rift Valley, we can see that Hadza exists in a rich regional language ecology, with languages from many different language phyla spoken alongside or nearby the Hadza-speaking area, here highlighted in red. Regarding language use and attitudes towards the language, I'd like to say that this is a complex and important topic and deserves considerably more attention and nuance than I've provided on this slide. For those of us who are interested in a bit more detail, I'd encourage you to read a report of a workshop held in 2018 in which some Hadza speakers, among speakers of other languages, shared thoughts about their language, the changes it is undergoing, and the prospects for the future. This can be accessed by scanning the QR code currently on screen. A first detail that we might notice is that there is huge variation in estimates for the number of people who speak Hadza. Work by anthropologist Nicholas Blurton Jones provides a figure of around a thousand, and work by the, Tanz by the Languages of Tanzania project gives more than 6,000. My colleague Richard Griscom and I, based on our documentary work, have a feeling that the figure is probably something around 2,000. In virtually all cases, Hadza people of all ages, including the youngest children, continue to use Hadza. But it's important to recognize that, though the Hadza people continue to use and transmit their language, the speaker community is a small population which, which lacks access to health care, education, political representation, and many of whom rely on the resources of a fragile forest ecosystem. Really, you know, the threats facing the Hadzabe people are significant and existential. Most Hadza speakers recognize that the way that they speak is markedly different from other languages of Tanzania, and my impression is that there is a considerable amount of pride in its use, both as a medium through which Hadza culture and everyday life is transmitted, and also as a code maintaining and establishing this sparsely populated community across a relatively large geographical area. At the same time, it's not uncommon to encounter Tanzanians from other ethnic groups who believe that Hadza simply is not a language. I'd like now to play a brief clip of the Hadza language so that we can both get a sense for how the language sounds and how it looks. This particular recording was made as part of the Hadza documentation project and is part of a conversation between local researcher Bunga Paolo on the left and Ate Pandisha on the right. Here they talk about taboos, particularly associated with hunting. <laughs> Poor, some grandma, mama, but 
Batashita, Kakonana, a puka, none. Was to get a chair at turn, that's a Amamukum, see, be cut in pieces one and near is a case of Baba and Gilodam. I'd like now to provide a bit more context on the linguists involved in the project. So my work in language documentation began in 2012 during my master's studies at the University of Dar es Salaam, where I began making recordings of another Tanzanian language, Gorwa, as part of my dissertation. This continued on and off through my doctoral studies at SOAS, during which I continued working with Gorwa, essentially making most of the decisions regarding the documentation on my own in a classic outsider-led documentation format. Things changed around 2017 when myself and my Gorwa colleagues decided to try something new. Instead of me going around with the camera and the recording device, we decided that actually training Gorwa speakers themselves to conduct this work would not only be more efficient, but it would also result in a richer documentation. So from this point, essentially to present, the Gorwa language documentation project continues with Gorwa speakers themselves not only producing recordings, but deciding who to interview, what to talk about, and how to go about exploring their histories, languages, and cultures. This insider-led approach was really a turning point in my documentary praxis, and basically all documentations I've been part of have been insider-led projects. In 2019, I began a similar insider-led project documenting Ihanzu, spoken in the same region of Tanzania, which we often call the Tanzanian Rift Valley. My colleague and uh, co-principal investigator on this project, Richard Griscom, has a somewhat similar research trajectory, beginning his work in Tanzania documenting a language called Azamjik Toga in 2015. Richard's project took a community-oriented turn in 2018, funded again by the Firebird Foundation. And in 2019, Richard and I began an ELDP-funded project documenting the Hadza language, spoken nearby to where Gorwa, Ihanzu, and Azamjeg are spoken in central Tanzania. And it is this documentation project which will be the focus of today's talk. In terms of talking about the project, today I will take a roughly chronological approach, dividing the project into three parts. The setup, that is, all of the steps which occurred before we began collecting data, the daily activities of the documentation itself, and then everything that occurred after the data collection ended, that is, the post-project. We'll start at the beginning with the project setup. It should be noted that from the very start, there were concerns about the viability of the project. In 2018, an anonymous review of the project proposal underscored wider commentary. Uh, both Richard and I had heard from documentary linguists about working with Hadza. So the quote reads, we are concerned that a community-based documentation might not be replicable for Hadza, given the small size of the Hadza community and its relative isolation, it is not clear if there is a group of Hadza available to do this kind of work at all. Richard and I have previously treated this topic in a dedicated talk, which can be viewed via the QR code on screen. But I include this quote here because it helps us underscore the ways in which our project was different to others. Put simply, when involving members of a speech community in the documentation of their own language, it's common to work with speakers who have some experience with formal education or technology. In the case of Hadza, community members have very little access to both. By most measures, the Hadza-speaking community could be described as low resource, marginalized, or existing outside of the larger power structure. And this was a central dynamic of the documentation project and was reflected in everything that occurred, perhaps especially in the project setup. I've broken the project setup into several major tasks and would like now to treat them in order. Uh, because Hadza communities are spread over a large area, we plan to have four teams, every team needed a basic set of equipment, so a recording device, video camera, computers for transcribing and translating recorded materials, external hard drives for storing and backing up materials, memory cards to go into the audio and video recording devices, etc. All of this material used to suitably equip a team of eight local researchers who had to share some equipment within their team cost close to 10,000 euro. Most of this had already been determined in the project applications as early as 2017. 
Beginning before our arrival in Tanzania and continuing for several weeks after arriving, we had to seek permissions. This is not only from the national level, Costec, but also at regional, district, ward, and village levels. Additionally, some Hadza communities also levy research fees which apply to certain areas and must be sought through other bodies. These fees normally go directly into community-developed projects, and research can't be conducted in these areas until they are obtained. One such community research fee applies to all of the communities within the red circle, uh, with communities outside of this circle deciding their own fee structures. Richard talks about many of the following steps in an earlier talk, which can be accessed by the QR code on screen, but with the goal of providing a thorough retrospective here, I will make some observations of my own. Another central task during the setup phase of the project was actually determining where many of the communities of Hadza-speaking people lived. This might sound like a superfluous observation, but because many uh, Hadza people live in small, semi-permanent settlements, often without government amenities, the location of many Hadza communities are not available on maps. And while I, and especially Richard, were familiar with uh, Mangola here within the Red Circle, we were much less familiar with the other areas in which Hadza communities live. This is because Mongola is much more accessible to outsiders. So uh, the roads are relatively good, as you can see in the video, and there are uh, amenities such as guest houses. Uh, compare this to the road to Sungu, which at the time was less of a road, as you can see in this video, and more of a footpath. So once we knew exactly where we were going, the next step was identifying Hadza-speaking people in these communities who would be interested in working with us during the documentation project. As local researchers, they would not only be the people using and maintaining the equipment on a daily basis, but also developing lines of inquiry and representing the project to their communities. It was important, therefore, to find people who were a good fit for this kind of work, a process which involved a lot of talking to people, a lot of meetings with both formal and informal community leaders, as well as just a lot of sitting around and being quiet and understanding how each of the communities worked and what their needs were. Having identified local researchers from each of the communities, the next step was to train them to conduct ethical audiovisual language documentation in each of their home communities. For this, Richard and I organized a five-day language documentation training workshop in the town of Haidom. For those of us interested in learning more about this workshop, Richard and I have prepared a short report which can be accessed by the QR code on screen. Major conclusions we drew after this workshop was that it was a key element of the entire documentation project, both in terms of orienting the researchers in the work they were about to start, but also in making them feel like members of a team and that they would be capable of carrying out this work. This is no small feat, as some of our local researchers had never previously used a computer. Uh, despite the successes, however, we concluded that five days was really too short for the kinds of things we needed to teach. And in the future, we would suggest a training workshop of around double that time to properly develop things like working orthographies and computer skills. Following the training workshop, each team of two then returned to their home communities to begin research. However, because most of the communities did not have electricity, it was necessary for Richard and I to visit each of these places relatively quickly after the training to set up what we called research stations, so buildings where equipment could be charged, safely stored, and where transcription, translation, and other business associated with the documentation project could take place. So this is a photo of me in Sungu during the process of setting up a solar power system on the roof of the local chairman's house. The equipment itself took around two weeks to arrive here. The shipment was delayed in Mwanza, and once it arrived in the nearest village, it took nearly a week to get it across the river, waiting for the water levels to subside to a safe level to wade across on foot. Following the setup, the project progressed into a period of approximately 20 months, during which Richard and I played a much less important role, and that of the local researchers really came to the fore. For around one day a week, local researchers would visit Hadza-speaking people in and around their communities, conducting interviews, recording songs, stories, and other aspects of language and verbal arts, 
This is a video of local researchers Nange and Angela traveling from their home community of Domanga and crossing the Hukumako River to Sangele, a small traditional community where Hadza people live near the forest and collect some of their food from hunting and gathering. So to us, this may seem like a far away and very sort of different, dare I say, remote place. But to Nange and Angela, this was a regular trip to visit and work with friends and family. Data collection, or making the recordings, is really only the tip of the iceberg, however. During and after the recording sessions, local researchers would then develop more detailed information about the recordings they made, who they involved, where they were recorded, what they spoke about. All of these details formed metadata, which accompanies every individual recording made. In documentation projects like this one, and I would argue every project that involves collecting data, the creation and organization of metadata is crucial. Not only does it help Richard and I understand the contents of a recording, but many aspects of the metadata are essential to finding and using recording once they're archived. Um, for this particular project, we employed a remote metadata creation system, which involved local researchers filling out a form for every recording they made and sending it via smartphone. Richard gives a detailed explanation of this system in an earlier talk, which can be watched via the QR link on screen. Less technical solutions can be used, however. For example, in earlier projects, I arranged things such that local researchers would fill out tables on a sheet of paper, which they would store in a binder. Following this, local researchers would then translate and transcribe the recordings they've made, rendering the recorded speech into a working Hadza orthography and providing a rough Swahili translation. This work is the most time-consuming of all. It's reasonable to assume that for every 15 minutes of natural speech, an efficient transcriber and translator would take at least 10 hours to complete. Needless to say, only a small percentage of all the Hadza material recorded has reached this stage thus far. Data backup, here appropriately represented at the heart of a workflow of data in uh, the field context, was also conducted on a regular basis, where local researchers would back up all of the material from one uh, large storage uh, external hard drive to a second one. This, however, didn't go perfectly and some data was lost. I've treated this specifically in a separate talk, so for a detailed discussion of this data loss and my reflections on how it went wrong and what we can do to fix it, I encourage you to follow the QR code on screen. Related to this is the everyday reality of maintenance. The entire language documentation runs like a machine, and if something wasn't working properly, I was required to fix it. This included working through computer bugs, adjusting video camera settings, repairing inverters for the solar power systems, fixing broken microphone stands, and so on. Usually, at first mention of a major problem, I would have to travel from wherever I was at the time to the site of the problem. And because of the geographical spread of the documentation project, this sometimes resulted in trips of several days and hundreds of kilometers. In fact, by the end of the funded project, I traveled more than 13,000 kilometers by motorcycle, the rough equivalent of driving from my hometown of St. John's, Newfoundland, all the way across Canada to Vancouver Island, and then almost all the way back again, mostly on rough roads like the one in the video. I use this observation not as a statement of machismo, but rather as a reminder that during this linguistics project, very little of what many people might identify as actual linguistics happened. Instead, most of my time was devoted to logistics, interpersonal relationships, and data management, keeping the wheels of the language documentation machine turning. Once the active data collection stopped, a whole other aspect of the project started. Some major elements I'll now discuss. Archiving refers to transferring a copy of all of the collected materials to a dedicated repository where the material will be stored and cared for into the future. The archive that Richard and I deposit our materials with is called the Endangered Languages Archive, ELAR, whose Associated Endangered Languages Documentation Program, ELDP, funded the project. It's a digital archive, so all of its holdings are electronic rather than physical, and materials can be set to openly accessible, which the majority of our materials are. Actually, archiving with ELAR happened during the active portion of the project as well, but it was especially prominent during the post-project period. 
In most cases, archiving is not simply sending a copy of the recordings to the archive by courier, but it's actually a very involved and time-consuming process of getting all of the project metadata into a form that the archive can use, as well as to ensure that there are no errors or repeats in the data. For a long-term project like ours, in which much of the metadata was written by local researchers in Swahili, this was a project which took several months. As mentioned above, because so much of the language documentation project is about simply maintaining workflows, and because this particular project was large, any sort of data analysis is, three years from the start of the project, really just beginning. Analysis for me typically involves returning to transcribed and translated material from local researchers and rendering the representations a bit more consistent and then importing the result into a software program called Flex for morphological parsing. Flex essentially becomes a linguistic database with which I can work to identify the kinds of grammatical patterns I would be interested in. Another important but perhaps overlooked part of the post-project phase is what happens to the relationships which were developed during the course of the work, which change once, once people stop actively working on the documentation, but which are still important nonetheless. So for me, this has meant a very active life on WhatsApp with local researchers, as well as physical visits when I can. It's important to remember that local researchers were at the center of the documentation project for many months, and helping them to feel engaged even after that work is over is a big part of the community-centered nature of the documentation. The principal output of the documentation project has been the archive deposit, which can be accessed online via the QR code on screen. In terms of size, it's composed of 226 hours of audiovisual recordings. That is, the collection represents 226 unique hours of songs, stories, procedural explanations, and other language and cultural material in the Hadza language. It's hard to measure the size of other electronically based archive deposits, but of the ones I'm aware, Hadza is one of the largest. Again, though, size is only one crude measure. I see the primary success of the documentation project in the range of genres recorded, the balance of gender and who was recorded, as well as how meaningful this work has been to the Hadza people involved. This is then a good time to focus on some reflections from some of the Hadza people most directly involved with the project, the Hadza local researchers who were employed during the course of the project. So toward the end of the active documentation portion of the project, I sat down individually with five of the nine local researchers and we talked for a bit about their perceptions of what happened. Uh, these recordings offer a wealth of insight worth its own entire talk, but today I'll limit things to three major themes that appeared again and again throughout what they said. Overcoming challenges, community-oriented outputs, and digital repatriation, and documentation as spaces for remembering. One of the common reflections was about how a lot of local researchers' time was spent fixing issues, solving problems, as well as figuring out how to do things for the first time in a way that would be appropriate for their context. Earlier I spoke about how much of my time was spent overcoming challenges, but the same could be said for the local researchers, and in many ways the challenges they faced were just as complex or more. Um, Traveling a long distance to work with a specific speaker and discovering upon arrival that they are no longer there, dealing with batteries that don't hold their charge in the heat, figuring out how to best involve every member of a community who values the inclusion of everyone rather than one or two individuals. All of these were challenges described to me, virtually none of which were planned for in advance or really could have been prepared for through formal training. So along with the demands of the regular workflow, there was the constant extra labor of doing what we had been warned was impossible, conducting a documentation project in a community which is low resource, marginalized, or existing outside the larger power structure. A second theme which ran through the reflections of local researchers was the importance the Hadza community gives to knowing what is being done with research conducted about them, as well as for research to be made relevant to them in some way. Because of their lifeways, which often stand out to outsiders, 
The Hobbs have a long history of being researched and unfortunately a similarly long history of being represented by outsiders in a range of questionable ways, something I've talked about in, a more, in more detail in a previous talk, which can be accessed by the QR code on screen. A central concern, therefore, of both the local researchers and the people they worked with was where these recordings were going, what they were going to be used for, and especially given their nature as cultural and historical resources, how they themselves could access them. This is not a completely solved issue, and some of this has to do with ensuring Hadza people can use and access the digital archive, but the issue is broader than that, extending to who writes about the Hadza people, what they do it for, and how this work can be done together with them instead of simply about them. A third theme that came across in the reflections of the local researchers was the fact that in the process of data collection, the documentation presented spaces for remembering. That is to say, the act of explicitly reflecting on Hadza language and Hadza culture, not with outsiders, but with the Hadza local researchers, with Hadza people themselves. This not only produced high quality recordings, but also sparked memories that might not have been otherwise evoked. So on hearing a song sung by one community member, another person came forward to offer another song they remembered hearing when they were little. The telling of a story would inspire a debate on a particular character or a particular period in Hadza history, as another example. Local researchers Bunga Paulo and Mariam Wanyawire sum up uh, in two very expressive quotes that I'll share here. Na wao kama wao walitumia hii kazi kama sasa kama darasa. Mhm. Mm La kutufundisha sisi wat vijana. Ni kama sasa tumeamsha moto. Mhm. Watu wamesha fikiri na kufikiri na kukumbuka na kukumbuka. To conclude, I don't really know how to conclude. From my perspective as one of the principal investigators of the Hadza documentation project, the months from late 2019 to late 2021 were some of the most professionally and personally challenging of my life, but also some of the most instructive, and I would even say transformative. The adaptation of a community-based documentation project to the Hadza context required considerable thought and effort at every stage, and has forced both myself and my co-PI, Richard Griscom, to both reimagine the role of the linguist in language documentation, but also to push the possibilities of documentary technology to, and sometimes past, its limits. The principal output of the project, fully archived and available online, represents one of the largest audio-video collections of an African language to date, more than 200 hours of songs, stories, interviews, life histories, legends, and explanations, virtually all of which has been researched and recorded by Hadza people themselves. And indeed, if there is one takeaway from this talk, it is that virtually all of this documentation was conducted by the Hadza people themselves, by a team of community members who produced the most prolific and informed work on the Hadza people in existence, not by means of any formal training, but by means of their emic knowledges and community support networks, a lifetime fast and deep. And this, of course, is the reason why this retrospective cannot have any satisfactory conclusion, because as long as these local researchers express their community's desire to see their work brought back and made alive to them, the project cannot be seen in any way as complete, but really only in its infancy, a library constructed, but whose books remain to be read. I would like to thank my colleague and friend, Richard Griscom, for his partnership during the Hadza documentation project. I would also like to thank Hadza local researchers Bunga Paolo, Mariamu Anyawire, Endeko Simon, Nange Chaka, Angela Sampson, Jacobo Lubumba, and Elizabeth Minja, as well as all of the Hadza people who have contributed their time, knowledge, and culture to the documentation project. Ate Pandisha appeared in a video on slide nine, and I appreciate his sharing his language and knowledge with us. Thank you, and here are my references.